Yeah. Up, losers. Hello. Hello there, Avery. Hello there, Avery. This is uh, Ian Bissett speaking. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Who here? Who here is uh, doing problem one on the uh, quiz? <laughs> Nobody, Gabriel. <laughs> shut up. <No. laughs> shut up, me. <Neelix. laughs> oh, Alex. I hope you don't mind. I invited a couple of people. <laughs> <laughs> Are there two different hey, Ryan Hopers? <laughs> it's Ryan's twenty-first birthday today. Say happy birthday. Mm -hmm. Wait, oh, change your name to Ryan Hooker. Do I really have to turn this quiz in? Yeah, what's up, Anthony? Alex, are you going to perform the album for us today? Fuck. <laughs> so we're not getting an opera? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, it's five o'clock. You know what that means? It's, it's Parkle lecture time. It's five o'clock somewhere. Yes. It's five o'clock on my watch. It's five, it's five, it's five. <clears throat> okay. So I would like to start off today's meeting by mourning the absence of someone that I thought was going to make it. And so, I am going to share with you a quick video by the Ninja Sex Party, for those of you who know that I once knew a ninja. So, <laughs> enjoy this one. <clears throat> Hey Danny, guess what? You suck, bitch. <laughs>
dirty kid inside But now you finally found your tribe Hit a crowd hear me yeah yeah wait a minute hello there's two people here who shouldn't be here there's a lot of people here that shouldn't be here a ninja has entered the chat wait a minute a ninja i shouldn't be here wait <laughs> there's somebody dressed up like that guy from that video <sighs> And his Who's name got is a ninja wet. mask? I don't know what you're saying. It's so weird. He looks just like Ninja Brian from the video. <laughs> hey, shit! Wait a minute. Look at that shirt that Ninja has on. Oh it could God. be a hijab. Oh my God. Oh, hey, <laughs> turtle. I'm trying really hard. Oh my God. I'm sorry. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh boy. And 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 there's this guy with a beard named Brooke. I have no idea who the hell he is. <laughs> Did you just hack on to my Zoom meeting? What's up with that? This is a little bit unnerving. We're, we were, we were going to have a lecture on the weak interactions today, and you guys have showed up. Hmm. That's a bit disconcerting. Why do all your t-shirts match? Wait a minute, Brookie, what shirt do you have on? Oh my gosh. Okay, okay. All right, so um, let me give it up for you guys. Um, with, uh, with another little uh, shared screen. So the, the two fellows that you see on, um, who shouldn't be on, but I'm lucky they are, are Mr. Brooke Williams and Mr. Brian Wecht. And they have joined us today. Uh, and we go way back. And I'm going to start with a two slide presentation <laughs> <laughs> of the highlights of our history. So, Alex, just can, a second. Can I take off the mask now, please? Yes, you can take <laughs> off the mask. It's a Brian face reveal. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Okay, so um, so me and Brian, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Yeah, good. Me and Brian and Brookie uh, met, well, Brookie and I go, go back a pretty good ways to about 1997. And then Brian uh, joined the group in about 2001-ish. Uh, but anyway, um, together uh, we actually wrote a paper. And of course, our names were conveniently uh, first letter labeled. WWF, the paper was called Constructing Non-Geometric Vacua and String Theory. And for me, it's my highest cited paper, but not for Brookie or Brian. But, uh, but in, in, just in case, when you see Williams Wecht Florida, you how to immediately it. think that we take advantage of that and we refer to the World Wildlife Federation. But that's a bunch of shit. We don't want the World Wild Wildlife Federation. We want the World Wrestling Federation. <laughs> <laughs> that indeed is how we referenced ourselves. Mm. But a few years later, we got together on a winter's afternoon and decided to write a five song opera that was inspired largely by the antics of turtles and shoes. And this led us to the creation of these wonderful t shirts. <laughs> is that a turtle? Sorry, say it again. Is that a turtle uh, fucking a shoe? Uh, I, can, I can answer this one, Alex. Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> love is love, man. That's okay. And that's, that's actually what's on the shirt, Avery, if you haven't paid that close of attention. Oh. It's the same picture that I just showed you. <laughs> Um, but what I thought about doing today uh, was bringing on these two guys um, to basically uh, give you uh, their stories about their experience in uh, school, their experience afterwards. Uh, it's rare that you get to sit down with three former string theorists, uh, but here you have three former three string theorists. and. Um, you know, some of you, that might be the path that you'd like to pursue, some of you not. But at any rate, uh, I think there's some interesting uh, information that, you know, we can share with you. So I'm going to start this by I have asking... a question. Oh, Ricky has a question. Um, are you suggesting the path they would want to do is be former string theorists or <laughs> string theorists? Well, I, I, think that, I think that our stories encompass a large scope. I mean, we have people who were like professional string theorists, people who bailed a bit earlier and people who took the teaching route. Um, and then there's people who peel away from that. So we'll get into the details of that in your stories. Um, but uh, yeah, so the way we're going to, way I'm going to run this, if that's okay with you all, is I'm going to ask Brookie and Brian some questions just to kind of uh, seed their discussion. And then I'll open the floor to you all uh, after we're done. Um, but I, I have to admit, both of these guys are hilarious. So their answers shall be nothing but entertaining, um, even if not incredibly informative. But I just wanted you to realize, you know, today is a fun day. We're obviously not going to cover physics improper today. But, um, but I think that this is as valuable a resource because I think you wanna see like where a, uh, an education in physics can take you um, and what interesting twists and turns can, can be a part of that. So I'm gonna get started uh, with a question to the a really uh, super famous guy, Brookie. Um, and Brookie, uh, I would like for you to tell me what got you interested in physics and um, maybe a bit about your undergraduate experience, uh, where you went to undergraduate school and so oh, forth. You. Any, any research that you did, <laughs> favorite classes, any experiences that are worth mentioning? Go for so, it. So from birth to grad school, is that the time period I'm covering? Not grad school yet. Okay, that, that, if up, up until, I, uh, um, I really loved my high school physics class. I thought, oh, I should, you know, become a high school physics teacher because that's what I thought a physicist was. Um, so I started out, uh, I went to UC Boulder 
and I started out uh, wanting to do physics. I actually, when I started, I really didn't, I wasn't much of a student in high school and uh, I, I went in and this was back, you know, when, when you like went up to like tables and signed up for classes by hand with number two pencils and stuff, um, which I'm sure is an experience you guys have. But they had given me a sheet of paper and one sheet of paper said, if you want to be a physics major, these are the classes you had to take. And another sheet of paper said, you know, you've done your whatever kind of exams to rank you and these are the classes you're, you have to take. And my physics class said, uh, the physics sheet said I had to take calculus. And this other sheet said I had to take like intro to college algebra. And I didn't know what to do. So I went to, I don't, I wish I remembered who it was. I went to one of the professors at CU Boulder who was like had office hours. And I was like, I, was, I said, hey, this says I need to take intro to college algebra. And this says I have to take calculus. What should I do? And he looked at me and he like had said nothing to me at this point and said, if that says you have to take intro to college algebra, you're not smart enough to be a physicist. Um, so that made me mad. And I, I think that's why I became a physicist to show it to this guy who I don't remember who it was. Um, but yeah, anyways, I, I actually, when I first started physics, I wasn't that into it, uh, my undergrad and then but I loved my math classes and was going to switch to math. And then I took a kind of modern physics class where we did some particle physics and kind of really basic quantum mechanics. And then I got really, really excited about physics. And I did uh, undergraduate research in high energy physics, like high energy experiment uh, for a few years. And, and, I, and I enjoyed that. But... I also knew I didn't, um, at least, I mean, although I'm really glad other people do it, I personally didn't want to spend 10 years working on an experiment. And, uh, mm -hmm. and plus I break most things I touch. So uh, it's probably not good to have me in a lab. Uh, so I decided to go into theory and um, then I applied to grad school and that's where my story ends, I guess. At least phase one. Mm -hmm. Ninja Brian. Same question. Same question. Do you want me to repeat it? For your no, I think you? I got it. Good. Uh, all right. So, I mean, the, the early part is just, you know, I was always interested in, in science and, uh, you know, computers and math and that sort of thing since I was a little, little kid. Um, and then in you know high school, took all the usual science classes. I, I did kind of placed up a couple grades in math. So I was able to take uh, multivariable calculus and kind of college level math in high school. So that kind of got me off. Like once I hit undergraduate on a, you know, like on a theoretical kind of path. Uh, so I went to a small liberal arts college in Massachusetts called Williams, where it's like, you know, just generally good, uh, uh, liberal arts kind of education, but not a, you know, there's no graduate degrees or no students. It's like, you know, kind of uh, uh, general, uh, you know, just general liberal arts stuff. Uh, and there, I was really psyched when I came in, I wanted to do physics and philosophy. So I'm basically jumping straight to the undergraduate, um, but we can talk about the earlier stuff if you guys ever want. Uh, so I want to do physics and philosophy was able to place into, you know, like there was this visiting guy who wrote this uh, quantum mechanics textbook, textbook, Eugen Mersbacher, and he's like this super old guy who was visiting and he taught this class on symmetries in physics. And it was really great. And I was like, oh my God, this is great. And the second physics class I taught was horrible. And it was like, the instructor was bad. It was like uh, first year mechanics level stuff. And it was just just awful. And I completely fell out of love with physics because I was like, this just sucks. The teaching's bad, the subject's boring. I don't even care. And so I became a math major and I did a double major because it's a liberal arts thing and music. And it was just like, all right, you know, I'll take like another year of physics, but kind of whatever. Took another physics class my sophomore year in E&M, like full year thing. And uh, that instructor was somehow even worse than 
my mechanics instructor, actually, I, this guy was awesome. He was, a, 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 I forget exactly where he's from, I think Columbia, Colombian condensed matter physicist who was teaching e &M, but was too afraid to touch any electrical devices. So anytime we needed to do an experiment, he would make one of the students go up while he stood on the other side of the room and turn on these generators or electromagnets or, or whatever. And this guy would like, just really, really bad instructor. And then I was just like, okay, I'm, I'm really done with physics now. Uh, did the whole undergraduate thing, took a lot of great math classes, which I really, really loved, especially uh, algebra and topology and, and things like that. Uh, and then my last year I was like, you know what? I got up to the point of taking quantum mechanics, but I never took quantum. So let me just do that. And I was doing a music like honors thesis, a composition thing at the time, but I was like, let me just do this kind of throw away this class just so I can say I took quantum at some point. And I took this class and I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. And I found out all the stuff that, you know, that I now love about physics. Uh, so it was just this kind of whim as a senior in college uh, that I took quantum and then ended up, it, the timing just happened. There was an advanced quantum class, which wasn't offered every year, but happened to be that year that I took my second semester and actually was about to go to grad school for composition, but got so enthralled by quantum mechanics that I, I didn't even drop out. Like I just didn't show up for music grad school. Uh, took a year to teach high school where I studied for the physics GRE took the GRE, bombed it, got like, I think actually the lowest score possible, uh, yet on the strength of letters or grades or whatever, somehow got into uh, San Diego for grad school and, uh, and ended up going there. So that was my journey to grad school. Awesome. Well, why don't you, Mr. Ninja? Uh, why uh, it's, you it, it's, it, Alex, it's Dr. Ninja, thanks. Sorry, um, Dr. Ninja Brian Wecht, uh, why don't you tell us about your experience in, uh, in grad school? Uh, also about just applying and uh, if, if San Diego was the only place you applied for, um, but tell us about your experience in grad school, the classes you took, deciding on research, your experience doing research uh, and so forth. Just tell us about your grad school experience. Yeah. Uh, so I got into when I when I got sorry when I got to San Diego, uh, I had no idea what I wanted to do other than just knowing I wanted I wanted to do something mathematical and theoretical. I knew I wasn't an experimentalist, so I just kind of took the uh, the standard first year classes, you know, which are at least at San Diego and in many places advanced versions of undergraduate oh, classes. Yeah. I have a question. How yes. did you know you weren't an experimentalist? I just never really liked doing exper I mean, I loved, you know, math. So I wanted to do math. And so I knew that, you know, obviously experimentalists do math, but I just never had a good time in labs. Uh, so it, it, maybe it's, it, you know, it's entirely possible. I could have found myself in a great lab at some point and then that would have been my thing. But I knew I loved math and theoretical physics seemed to be like the, you know, the way to do the most math. Uh, so I took the first year classes and, you know, just, it was like mechanics, uh, stat mech, uh, e &M, God, what else, uh, quantum, you know, kind of the standard stuff. It was on a trimester system. So there are a few electives, but you couldn't take those in your first year. So I took all the first year tennis classes and then there's a qualifying exam at the end of the year, which everyone's just studying their ass off for uh, basically the whole time. And I got into research because we had this guy who, the guy who was our classical mechanics uh, instructor, uh, was this like middle-aged guy who was a, a fusion theorist who worked on plasma physics. And I was like, this guy was like a real cranky bastard. Uh, and I was like, that dude, that's the guy I want to work with. Because he was really, really, you know, he's just... He was a nice guy, but in that really kind of edgy, not edgy in like an edgy way, but like just had kind of prickly way. Uh, I thought he was hilarious and I really liked uh, his personality. Uh, and so I was like, I just want to work with, with this guy. Pat Diamond was his name. And he works on theoretical plasma physics. Okay, great. And so I got involved in that. And it was really cool stuff, actually. There was a lot of, there's an element of 
of chaos. There's a lot of statistical mechanics. Uh, there were, you know, uh, uh, a lot of uh, turbulence and nonlinear phenomena, like cool, 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 interesting stuff. Um, and kind of pursued that for a couple of years, actually the end of my first year and then into my second. And then like, I kind of realized that I didn't know anything about this when I started, but uh, pl most of plasma physics is, is classical physics. So you're really not doing anything quantum mechanical uh, for most of these systems. And largely what it is, which again, I didn't know at the time is you write down the uh, equations for like charged fluid flow, uh, which is magnetohydrodynamics. And because they're terrible nonlinear equations, you, you can't solve them. And so in my experience, what plasma physics was, was a large number of Russian guys screaming at each other about which terms to cross out in the equations so you could actually solve them. And then there were endless arguments about, well, oh no, you're in the regime where this term is small, or blah, blah, blah. It was like the, the actual process of doing it, I didn't find that fun and I wasn't super interested in the, uh, the research problems. And so I took, as part of my second year, I took uh, quantum field theory because I was like, okay, well, I took quantum the first year, that seems like a, a cool thing. And in the process of taking quantum field theory, I was like, oh my God, this is like, this is the stuff I wanna be doing. So I kind of scattered around to see if maybe I could change advisors and found a young uh, string theorist that had just been hired at, at San Diego, this guy, Ken Trilligator, and had this very like soul searching kind of process of like, okay, am I really gonna, you know, it's hard to leave an advisor for another advisor. It's kind of like breaking up with someone. Uh, but, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do in terms of research interests. And so I got the, you know, I talked to this guy in Trilligator and he was like, yeah, you know, if you want to be a student, like you did well in your classes and on the qual and all that stuff, like you can come on as my student. And so I switched over from uh, fusion, fusion theory to, to particle physics. The other thing about plasma physics is that at least at the time, uh, like it really was going nowhere as, you know, uh, as a viable energy source, like everything was totally inefficient. And the only jobs, I went to one plasma conference and the only jobs listed were in the field of what they called thermonuclear instabilities at, you know, Los Alamos. So it was like, oh, you'll be building bombs. And that really did not seem like a fun career path. I have a question for everybody in the room. Does anyone know anybody in our department who's from a background in plasma physics? I do, in fact, know about the one and only Chuckle Stone. There you go. Yeah. All right. Plasma, it's, it's, All right. It's, it's, yeah, it's really Wait cool stuff. Like, there's, there's so much cool stuff. It just wasn't my personal uh, bag. What's this about Chuck Stone? Uh, Chuck is the only person in our department that's from a plasma physics background. Oh. But Chuck doesn't do research anymore. Ryan, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, okay. So what was your research with uh, Ken like? Sorry, you muted just at the end. What, what was it like with Ken? Is that what you were asking? Okay, yeah. Uh, so at first, it was <laughs> I, I had a rocky start to research because uh, Ken, there was this thing called string field theory, which I don't even want to describe, except it was notorious as one of the, like, if you could solve it, it'd be amazing, but super hard areas of string theory. And there were some interesting results uh, at the time about uh, these extended objects that were unstable, they're called uh, D brains. Uh, and they could decay, and what did they decay into? Did they just vanish or, or what? And so anyway, I was like, hey, there's some interesting papers on this, like read these papers and explain them to me, which is actually a great thing, a great general idea. Read this and explain it to me. Great thing for an advisor to tell a student. Can happen to pick like the hardest thing going at the time in string theory, and I bashed my head against a wall for like a year, just trying to understand what was going on. 
And there were also these two groups at the time that were kind of competing with each other in this field, who were these like, you know, top of the line researchers at like super fancy places, you know, like the Harvard or Princeton group or whatever. And I had no hope of ever writing any paper, uh, you know, that would compete with what these guys were doing. And the moment I, I knew if I ever figured anything out, someone else would publish it immediately. So it was really like, I spent, you know, the first year of doing research desperately trying to understand these papers having no luck at all and trying and then trying to find a research project on top of that which I also had no luck doing so I spent the first year of doing research like in in research hell like I was just miserable and of course you're, I'm trying to learn everything and go to seminars there were not many people worldwide working on this stuff no one was even like nearby it was awful uh, I liked Ken a lot. He was a great like guy to talk to, just very approachable and acceptable, uh, accept, uh, accepting. Uh, you know, just really fun guy, but like didn't know a lot about this field, so he couldn't help me. I didn't know anyone that could help me. And then the year after that, I applied for this like visiting program in Santa Barbara, where Brooke was a grad student, and uh, and actually in the middle here met came to. Uh, Boulder to do the summer program there. Tassie, we met Alex and Brooke. Um, so went to Santa Barbara and there were people working on it there. Met a couple of researchers I could talk to. Started a project, didn't go anywhere. It was just like awful. And so basically I did two years of totally unproductive research. And then finally, Ken was like, all right, you know, why don't we just call it on this project because nothing is happening. And I can see that like he didn't have any direction to point me and I wasn't being successful so we just kind of started something else he was like oh just start thinking about this other thing and long story short this random other thing that he had me start like thinking about ended up leading to a big result that kind of launched my whole career so it was really this process of like oh god what am I going to do and then just stumbled upon like something interesting that worked out nice uh, Brookie, how about your days considering grad school and then actually going? Oh, um, all right. Uh, so yeah, I guess um, the two schools I was uh, debating between, I got into Princeton and Santa Barbara. Um, and I'm telling this story because Alex told me to. <laughs> um, and so I gotten into Princeton and Santa Barbara and I just assumed I was going to go to Princeton uh, because it's Princeton. And uh, I visited both schools because it was a free trip to California and that seemed like a good idea. And um, I really enjoyed being at Santa Barbara. It's also, it was probably, you know, it's an amazing place to do uh, theoretical physics. You had the Institute for Theoretical Physics there. Uh, now the K Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics. Um, and um, so it was a great place, but it still wasn't Princeton. And I felt like, okay, I have to go to Princeton, but I really love being in Santa Barbara. And when I visited Princeton, I really didn't like it that much. And I was talking to a professor about it in Boulder and they said, well, look, if you, if you stay in physics, if your career is a physicist, it's, everyone's gonna know Santa Barbara is a great school and it's never gonna make a difference in your life. Like it's not gonna hurt you at all. But if you ever decide to leave physics, having a PhD from Princeton versus having a PhD from uh, Santa Barbara will be a, you know, a big difference. So I knew there was no chance I was ever gonna leave physics. So I said, I'm going to Santa Barbara. Um, and then I left physics. But uh, I mean, there, was, there was like eight or nine years in between then. But uh, so yeah, um, I'm still really glad I went. Uh, I, I definitely made the right decision. Uh, but yeah, so that's how I ended up in Santa Barbara. I decided early on I wanted to do string theory probably more because it sounded fancy than because I really knew what it was about, uh, which isn't how you should make your decisions, um, but um, that's what I did. And I found an advisor. Um, I kind of 
they did an interesting thing there where there was a bunch of incoming grad students who wanted to do string theory. So they taught a string theory class and then just gave like the five students or so who did well uh, a position. Um, so it quickly, the class when we started was like, I think 20 people, maybe 30 people. And then when it ended the second semester, I think it was only like the five of us who ended up going into stream. So, um, but it, it was a really great course. I, I loved it. I started working uh, for Gary Horowitz, who does, he's a string theorist, but his background is uh, kind of general relativity. And he does a lot of work um, using kind of similar methods to what you use in GR and kind of focusing on that. Um, and I did a project with him that was, you know, I enjoyed doing it. Um, and it was, it was kind of, it was coming up with a toy, uh, a toy model uh, for w what it might look like. You know, so one of the questions is when you have the Big Bang is what happened before the Big Bang. So my, the problem is in classical physics, you have a singularity there and you can't evolve backwards in time beyond that point. And so these D-brain objects that Brian had mentioned, people, um, I kind of proposed some scenarios where we could be living on a D-brain and it was one way of kind of resolving that singularity was by going to higher dimensions. Um, and you just basically have D-brains colliding with each other and that on, in the three-dimensional world looks like uh, it can, in the right scenario, look like a Big Bang. And so I kind of worked on this toy model to do this. Um, two kind of interesting things that came out of that was I, I couldn't solve these differential equations. So I spent like months kind of coming up with numerical results and then analyzing those numerical results and was about to publish the paper like had given it to everyone to read, was about to put it to the archive. And I, uh, I had it, yeah, I was just going through things and I realized that there was a conserved quantity. Um, so in physics, I'm sure you guys know this, um, that when you have these conserved quantities, it leads to wonderful things. You have these symmetries in your theory and then you can kind of really simplify your equations. But there was this conserved quantity I had just ignored and I went from having like a 30 page paper with all these numerical kind of uh, approximations to realizing this was a conserved quantity and symbolically solving it in two lines and it being like this eight page paper that was super simple. So that was thing one, like even though it was a much better eight page paper than a 30 page paper, but uh, uh, it was still kind of like I put all this work and it completely became something else. And then I, I put the paper up in the archive and was very excited and about, uh, I don't know, like maybe a week later, I got an email from someone and I was really excited because they were commenting on my paper. And the email was from these uh, professors in Greece and they were like, we did this uh, a year ago. <laughs> Here's our paper, go look at it. Um, and they had solved it in a slightly different way. Um, and my way was more elegant, but they had already done the work. So I never even bothered to submit it to a journal. Um, I, I was saddened. Um, but anyway, so my professor Gary put me on another project that was very similar and I was going through it and I got back to where I was. This time there wasn't a conserved quantity to save the day and I was doing this numerical work to try to solve these complex differential equations and I wasn't enjoying it. And so I went to my advisor and I said, I said, hey, I'm not really having that much fun doing this. I kind of want to do something more mathematical, like more kind of uh, pure mathematics uh, without computers. And he said, well, you know, that's not really what I do, the kind of thing you're interested in. So just go out and find a project. And if you do, that's fine. Um, otherwise, keep working on this. So uh, 
I started working uh, on a project with Simeon Hellerman uh, and John McGreevy, uh, who were both grad students at the time. Uh, uh, Simeon Hellerman was at Santa Barbara um, and John McGreevy was at Stanford. Both very, very brilliant people, both very, very different people. Um, uh, but I ended up writing a paper with them uh, called Geometric Constructions of Non-Geometric String Theories. Um, and it got me into this path of thinking about the fact that this higher symmetry group that you have in string theory allows for kind of uh, trying to describe it in the simplest way, but you, when you normally think about geometry as like the background in which your physics happens, it has certain rules. And because in, uh, in string theory, uh, that background is, you have this larger symmetry group and yes, you can have a background which is kind of geometrical the way you normally think about it, but you can also think about it, you can also, things can happen that wouldn't happen in order in a geometrical kind of background for your problem. And so you're starting to think when you hear about, if you, string theory and you hear about compactifications and these uh, interesting geometrical manifolds, um, you, you can have things that aren't actually geometry. And it got me thinking about that. Um, and then my next few papers were on that, um, including the one that Alex and, well, I guess, one was with Alex and Brian, uh, the one he showed, and then the one after that was just me and Alex. Um, so that kind of set my path. Um, that led me, that was what I was working on as an, a graduate student. Um, I ended up going to, uh, um, are we supposed to talk about postdocs? That was next, but go right ahead. All right, I ended up going to, when I was applying for postdocs, I made, a decision uh, that I wanted to go live in Europe. So I applied to schools in Europe uh, and I applied to like schools in Europe and then a couple of schools in the States. But my main kind of goal was going to, uh, to, to Europe. But um, I ended up getting, going to the University of Amsterdam to do my postdoc. Um, and I actually went on a, National Science Foundation grant. So I was, even though I was at the University of Amsterdam, I was uh, being paid by the US government. Your tax dollars hard at work. Um, and uh, yeah, so I ended up doing that same research there. Uh, the, the funny story, oh, I guess I was about to say it was Brian, but it wasn't. Um, I had gone, when I went to go give uh, talks to try to get into um, to try to get into uh, get postdocs. Uh, I I went. I did a bunch of talks at various schools uh, throughout Europe, and then I came back and was giving a talk at Princeton. And uh, I was at uh, that Institute for Advanced Studies, not for my talk, but just having lunch with some people there. Uh, and this uh, very uh, famous professor was eating lunch with us. Uh, and he's known for being a bit uh, uh, blunt, uh, I guess is the nicest way to say it. And I'm sitting at this table, he's sitting across from me and he hadn't spoken to me that much. And then he's like talking to some other people and he goes to get up and he's like, well, I gotta go back. I have all these postdoc applications to look at. And he's like, I've got a big pile of postdoc applications on my desk. And I look at him and I said, if you want me to, I can go put mine on top. And he looks at me and goes, I'm sure you've been properly filed and walked away. <laughs> so uh, he, he, he did not admit me to Princeton for my postdoc. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, that was kind of my physics career. Brian, tell us about your postdocs, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, in Actually, I, I wanted to circle back real quick and say one thing about uh, grad school because Brooke reminded me. Um, I, uh, halfway through your, your story about should you go to Princeton or Santa Barbara, 
uh, reminded me of this. So halfway through grad school, when I actually switched to working with uh, Ken to do string theory, I had a, my old advisor was like, you got to get out of San Diego, dude. He's like, it's too, too small and it's not fancy enough. Get out, go to apply to fancier places. And I applied and got into Santa Barbara for one. And uh, it was, was basically told by everybody except my current advisor, Ken, like, you have to get out of San Diego because it's just too small and the group's not big enough. And uh, they were like, if you want to be a serious physicist, like this isn't the place. And ended up, again, through a soul searching thing, just gut instinct, like I really like this guy I'm working with uh, staying in San Diego. And that gut instinct that Brooke had to go to Santa Barbara was my gut instinct to stay in San Diego. And I'm pretty sure if I had gone to a fancier place, I would have been steamrolled and outclassed and you know, ended up dead in the ditch somewhere. But I stayed in San Diego because it felt like the right option. And it totally was for me. So I think that like following your gut on what the right move is for you personally, uh, even if other people are giving you advice that says the opposite is really important. Anyway, moving on. Uh, th this is a very, so I ended up doing four postdocs before I got a faculty job. Uh, in our field, postdocs are usually three years, although that varies a little bit depending on where you are. Uh, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's five, whatever. So from San Diego, as I said, I had this big result that got a lot of attention. Uh, I was able, uh, like I was very, very lucky that I got kind of offers from all the fancy places and ended up going to MIT. Had a great time there as a postdoc and did a lot of stuff with non-geometric theories, which my work with Brooke and Alex was like my first, uh, you know, pulled into and ended up working with uh, a bunch of MIT people on non-geometric stuff. And that, that like, it was a whole bunch of people around the world working on it at the time, um, including Brooke in Amsterdam and Alex in Israel. Uh, or were you, in, were you in Israel at the time, Alex? Is that right? I was. Yeah. Um, and so had a great three years at MIT. I worked on uh, the non-geometric stuff. I worked on some other things having to do with these, uh, what are called supersymmetric gauge theories, which is what my big result was in. And ended up, you know, still doing well as a postdoc and getting a lot of attention for my research and that sort of thing. Then I went to this Institute for Advanced Study uh, in Princeton for a second postdoc, so that's three years later. Uh, had a great time there. This was around the time the LHC was about to turn on. So there was a lot of like excitement uh, over that. I started working on, on that area of theoretical physics for a little bit uh, called phenomenology. Although what I did was only phenomenology in like uh, a very loose sense, but I you know played around with something more realistic than string theory and non-geometry. And then after, so also in the middle of this was the financial collapse of 2008. And so when I was kind of at my peak, like higher ability, I've been applying for faculty jobs this whole time. Like kind of when I was like at the point in a career where people would typically start getting jobs, the entire financial system collapsed and there were no jobs. And so like there were a couple of years in there where I think one person got a job in the US, like re really nobody. Um, and so I was kind of like, well, fuck, what do I do now? And I was like, well, I still want to do physics, so let's keep going. And I got to the end of my time at, at the, uh, the Institute for Advanced Study, so six years into a postdoc now. So I did, it took six years to do my PhD, six years of postdoc, so I'm like 12 years into this physics thing, and applied for postdocs and crickets, like nothing. And all the stuff I wanted, like, all you know, I was at this top, top place and applied to kind of similar level places, you know, Stanford, uh, Harvard, whatever, just nothing. And the only offer I got was, uh, which came like relatively late in the process was Michigan, which is a great school. I'm not talking trash about Michigan here, but it was not at the level that I had currently been at as a, uh, as a postdoc. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna kind of read the signs in front of me it looks like I was going up and I kind of reached a peak. And so I'm going down now and I turned down the Michigan offer 
and said, you know what, I'm just, this is my last year as a physicist. I quit. I'm going to find something else to do. I don't know what it is. Probably not going into finance or something because I didn't really want to do that. Uh, but I, I feel like I'm, you know, making the right move here. And showed up, this is over kind of winter break stuff, showed up at, uh, at the, the IAS right after winter break. And this same guy that Brooke was talking about, this blunt physicist, basically grabs me by my ear and pulls me into his office. And he's like, what the fuck are you doing? You take that job. And I was like, but he's like, I think, I think they've offered it to someone else. He's like, they haven't offered it to someone else. Call them right now. I'm going to watch you. And so I called Michigan back and I was like, hey guys, it's me. Uh, is that job still available? And they were like, we thought you might come back. And luckily, I mean, really by the skin of my teeth, uh, I accepted it and, and like just got it. But any other, like any other uh, institution would have immediately given that job to someone else because, you know, like you're trying to get the best ask people as early in the game as, as po early in the process as possible because you know the best people best being a relative thing here of course the most uh, uh competitive people get picked off first it's like a first round draft thing and the longer you wait the lower on your list you are so i can't believe they didn't offer it to someone else uh so i went to michigan um and like i loved it it was great it was a great group i knew a bunch of the people there and you know it was a three-year job but I was like, all right, let me, let me just see what happens here. Uh, heard some noises from a lot of theoretical physicists or, you know, just gossip pounds. So I heard some uh, rumors from a friend at Harvard that they were maybe interested in hiring me as a postdoc. So I was like, you know what? It's kind of like unorthodox to apply after one year of a three-year postdoc, but let me just see what happens. So I applied to Harvard as a postdoc. And at the same time, and I've been applying for faculty jobs this, this whole time, like saw a friend of mine on Facebook in England. He said, hey, my, my university's hiring. Like we have a, a hard deadline. It's a really fast process. If you think you might want to move to London, apply for this faculty job. And again, long story short, within the space of two weeks, I got offered a postdoc at Harvard and a faculty job in London. So I went from within a year being like, hey, my physics career is done, I quit, I'm out, to getting a faculty job and like a postdoc at this incredible uh, institution. So um, uh, yeah, so I went to London, I did spend a year at Harvard as a postdoc. So I was Michigan for one year, Harvard for one year, and then went to London as a, uh, as a faculty member and the nice thing about uh, the UK system is there's no tenure process. You kind of walk in the door and you're basically permanent. So I, you know, became a professor or what they call a lecturer uh, in London. Now, Alex, do you want me to talk about the next part? Or well, uh, I was going to say, next? so So at this point, you've both made it through postdocs. Brian's faculty, Brookie's kind of on the fence and and now i want you to kind of wrap up by telling us about how you ended up where you are now and who wants to go first i can't i was going to say obviously as given from the intro you guys all saw brian's uh is much more fun so maybe i should go first Although my, I've, I've, had, I've had a lot of fun getting to where I'm at. I love where I'm Oh, at. you have. You've got quite a story. Um, you have a great story. I, I story. have a great story, but I didn't become a rock star. That's just... Tell, tell your story. Okay. Um, so I was at um, Amsterdam. I had a two-year on this NSF, but the university was going to pay for me to have another year there. And after my second year, I was feeling... I, I really liked my research, but I also only cared about the work I was doing. Whereas like the good physicists knew everything about everything. And that wasn't me. I just liked working on problems and I would get really into the problem I was on, but I just, I don't know. I could just tell I wasn't a physicist. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't really what I wanted to do for the next 50 years. I also, this was uh, George, 
W. Bush Jr. had just been reelected. I was feeling uh, uh, a bit worried about the uh, direction of the planet and wanting to contribute more. And uh, I, uh, I decided I wanted to go like work in economic development. So I moved to South America without a plan. Um, I started working in a kitchen in South America, uh, cooking at, at a little cafe in uh, Chile, and then um, learned Spanish. And that was great. I spent like, I was going to be there for like a few weeks, but a few months originally, but I was having a lot of fun. Also, if you're trying to learn Spanish, Chile is a really silly place to go do it because they speak so strange. Um, so it was taking a while. And uh, anyways, from there I ended up in Peru and I did work in microfinance for a while in Peru. Uh, and that was great, but I wasn't getting paid um, and I needed money. Um, so I started building websites for people um, back in the States. Um, just like in the evenings, like I didn't really know how to code or anything at the time and just kind of figured out how to do it. And it was a way to make a little bit of extra money. Um, so uh, that was a lot of fun. It's been a couple of years in Peru uh, with a short stint on Alex's couch. Um, and uh, then I eventually just, uh, you know, I, I also realized that this wasn't the direction I wanted to go. So I was, I was bouncing around a lot. Um, and I, so I came back to the States. Uh, I had built up a bit of debt from not having a real job for three years and uh, just started continuing. Like I was already on this website thing. So I started doing web development, initially freelance. Uh, I was living in New York doing that for a few months. Got to hang out with Brian a lot of, right before he became famous. And uh, then I moved off to San Francisco and started working for various companies, uh, but I was never, I was still in this place. I'd left physics because I wanted to do something more meaningful. And I was building random websites for Verizon or something like this. And uh, uh, it, it wasn't satisfying. I, I kind of enjoyed the work, it was okay. It was nice getting a real paycheck, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, so I was always looking for, you know, how can I kind of get back to where I wanted to do, do things that I, I felt better about, that I could kind of apply everything I knew. And the kind of first step in that direction, I worked for this startup that was using cell phone technology to um, track worker conditions in developing countries. So we had places in Bangladesh and Turkey where we'd monitor like factories and stuff and workers could kind of say if they were being abused or, you know, bad things were happening and safety conditions were bad. Um, so I did that for a couple of years. Um, and then, um, but it was still, even though I was excited about the end point of the work, I, it was still just kind of this web development stuff. I wasn't really using any math or doing anything. I was, um, I was super excited about. Uh, so I ended up become going into data science um, and now I work for, the, I'm a director of data science for the World Resources Institute, which is a super great organization. Um, they monitor our, uh, they kind of, they, they work in kind of every kind of environmental field kind of monitoring the planet, seeing what's going on. So the first things I worked on when I moved over to World Resources Institute was using satellite imagery to detect when people were cutting down trees. Um, and uh, from there had done just a myriad projects uh, where I'm, I'm currently working on a project detecting like ephemeral water sources that can be used for malaria risk maps and things like that studying like land use, land cover, um, so we know, uh, you know, what, what the planet's being used for, um, so we can monitor as people, if, you know, you leave forest, you can start saying why is forest being cut down, um, et cetera. So this has been, it's really a really great, it's been the perfect endpoint for me, um, because 
I'm doing work that's kind of directly applied to the world and environmental causes I care about. Um, I get to do math. Um, I get to, I mean, it's pretty simple math. It's not as fun as the math you do with physics, but I'm still doing some math. Um, I, most of my work is kind of neural network, deep learning stuff. And that's a lot of fun. Um, it, there's a lot to learn and you get to read papers and publish papers and it feels kind of like you're a physicist still. still. Um, and, and yes, and then I'm also marrying into that this all the computing skills I built up kind of when I randomly decided to start building websites. So it's, it's been a very strange path, but everything fits together in exactly the right way. Um, yeah. So now I'm in San Francisco and I do that. That's fun. Nice. Nice. Uh, Dr. Ninja. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, when I, they, they, I'll backtrack a little bit like I did before. When I was in grad school, I decided to take uh, start taking improv comedy classes because it was like a thing to do that wasn't physics. Uh, so I did that just like a night a week, whatever. It was just like, I figured it'd be fun. And it was fun. Uh, super low pressure class, like not a professional uh, theater group or anything like that. And then kind of got involved in the improv scene in San Diego, I was playing music, I was doing a tiny bit of acting, uh, all wall in grad school. And uh, when I went to MIT, I kind of kept up with the music and started getting involved in comedy in, in Boston, uh, mostly as a musician. Little Again, a little bit as an actor, but more as a, as a musician. Uh, and that actually, Boston is where I met my wife, Rachel, because she was an actor and I was a musician and we played at the, the same club. Uh, and when I moved from MIT to the Institute for Advanced Study, I was like, you know what, let me just kind of start doing stuff in New York because I'm close to New York. And a uh, friend of a friend met a dude. We started a, a comedy band where I dressed up as a ninja and we, you know, did like a two person comedy act, all like live shows and, and stuff like that. And that like would be performing regularly in, uh, in New York City, again, like small clubs, never had more than, if we were lucky on a good night, we had 20 people at a show. Like that was like the peak of our uh, attendance. But we're involved in a community there in New York, um, along with a, a bunch of other kind of uh, up and coming uh, comedians. And it was great. And so we started making videos and became like a more YouTube centric act. And anyway, there's, there's a lot of ins and outs of this. There was something, this band, which we called Ninja Sex Party, uh, was just something that, uh, you know, was like a fun thing to do on the side. And my partner, Dan, in that was like, he, this guy had no other career. Like he used to live in his car in Philadelphia for a while. Like he was staking everything on comedy working out. He wasn't that much younger than, than me. He was four years younger than, than, than me. So at the time he was like late twenties. I, I think I was 32 when we started the band. He was like 28, 29. Uh, and uh, we uh, just kind of kept this going. And he was like, look, this is my career. And he knew, I mean, he knew what I did. He knew I was a physicist. Uh, but I was like, I basically said, look, I'll make this promise to you. You know, I'm on this track and I have to follow this. I'm going to be applying for faculty jobs. If I get a job somewhere, I'm going to have to move there. But if it ever gets to a point where this band could be like an actual career, I will quit academics and do this full time. I said, but I, you know, I'm married at some point. I'll have a kid, which I did after we moved to London. Like I need to, you know, be, there's no such thing as a sure thing but I need to be reasonably sure that it's not a stupid, insane move to like quit this thing I spent 20 years trying to do to dress up in a ninja costume and write dick songs. Uh, Can I so interject we, here? Yes. I just want to say, you told me at the time you had said this to Danny and I thought, well, that's never going to fucking happen. Oh yeah, you and me yeah, both. Yeah, that, that was clearly a crazy thing to say. It was like saying, you know, you know, yeah. It was crazy and wasn't going to happen. It was crazy. But this was always my, like, when I was in the, the pits of research hell, when physics wasn't going well, when results weren't working out, when I didn't think I'd get a job, 
you know, that like grass is always greener thing was like, oh, maybe someday there's a career in comedy or something like this. Okay. Oh my God. Hola. Uh, uh, so we kind of kept it up and I moved to London and it was like, well, that's, you know, that's the death of the band. Like he's, he had actually moved to LA uh, when I moved to London. And it's like, now we're on different continents. Uh, uh, so, you know, oh, well, but because of this thing called the internet, we could do it remotely. So I, I would write music uh, in London and send it to him. And we'd, you know, he'd tell me what he liked and we'd kind of do it back and forth for a little bit. And so we actually increased our productivity when I moved to, uh, to England. And then about a year after I moved to England, and this is, uh, let's say three years into the life of the band, um, uh, Dan got basically cast on a very popular YouTube channel, which made him and the band and me kind of really kind of hockey sticked our growth. And uh, within, yeah, that channel was called Game Grumps. It's a video game channel and uh, we go, well, let's play in, in YouTube language. Uh, and suddenly people like our channel, Ninja Sex Party had been kind of creeping along, but that now like people could, there was this big platform that we had access to. And it like w within about a year of that happening, and that's two years into my faculty job, like, wait a minute, this is actually a career. Like this, this is the band uh, hasn't put out another album, but it seems like this is a reasonable, like alternate career. It doesn't seem, if I were to quit now, it wouldn't be stupid. So I thought about it long and hard at this point. Also, when we moved to London, I told Rachel, my wife, I was like, this is the last move. You know, it's a permanent job. We're never moving again. Two years later with a newborn, it was like, actually, there's this other thing. And she was cool with it. Uh, and I was able to get the video game channel to hire me on there uh, as well as like a social media manager, which, you know, with a, a baby, I like, I needed health insurance or something like just some kind of uh, to, to make sure I wasn't starting from literally zero. At this point, Ninja Sex Party is still not quite a career, but it looked like it might become one. And so after one of the hardest periods of soul searching I've ever had to do, of abandoning this career for fear, and this is also the year I turned 40, by the way. So on paper, this looks like a midlife crisis where I take this very stable, like actually permanent job and throw it out the window in order to go dress up in a ninja costume in LA. Uh, and because uh, that's where Dan was, that's where all the things we needed to do would be. Um, but I was like, you know what? I don't make this choice now with, with my wife's support, which I had, uh, this is going to be the kind of like regret it for the rest of my life thing. Like this is the chance let's, it might flame out like immediately, but at least I can say I did it. And, and the timing was crazy. So I quit my job, uh, in England. And I also, I made a tactical mistake because I told them on April fool's day, uh, that I was leaving. Be it, no, no, literally no one believed me. And I had to, I had to be like, no, this is act like, yes, I'm leaving to become a YouTuber. Uh, and uh, they were like, no, come on, dude, you know, you're 40. Like, what, what the fuck are you talking about? Um, but eventually they realized I was serious. And, uh, and then in July, we moved to LA. And the band's third album came out two weeks later and like was was a huge hit and actually made enough money to live off of and then it was like oh my god this like this is this is real like i can i can actually do this and so i was lucky that the my department in england uh granted me basically a year like grace period to pull a reset switch and come back you know no problem they told me if i could say you know if i could decide one way or the other as soon as possible, that would be great. But, uh, you know, they were giving me, if I needed to take the full year, I could just walk back. Albeit after moving internationally, you know, again, twice, but I could have that job back if I wanted it, which was really, really cool of them. Like they did not need to do that. Um, 
And so we moved on July 1st. Uh, band's third album came out on July 17th uh, and it was a big hit. And uh, a month later, like late August, I don't remember the exact date, I wrote the department in England. It was like, I'm out, I'm not coming back. Like this is, this is actually a career now. And now like this is, I've been in LA for five years and actually a little more, it's like five and a half now. Uh, sorry, no, the other way around. It'll be five this summer. Um, and uh, it's like, it's a career. Like we, with the band, we make enough money to, to get by and are selling albums. And we did, you know, we've done world tours. Uh, we did Australia, New Zealand, Europe. And it's like, a, I mean, it is actually a, and I hate to say it because it's such a cliche. It's like this crazy dream come true kind of thing where I took a, you know, a calculated but still kind of stupid chance and it ended up uh, like having, being more successful than I could ever have hoped. And because it like, because it's the industry stuff, everything feels like it could just fall off a cliff tomorrow and then I'm out of a job. But I, I mean, is that going to happen? Probably not, but you know, things will have ups and downs, but it is like, you know, this, I'm not going back to physics uh, at this point. And it's become like this thing that has let me do stuff beyond my wildest dreams. So yeah, let's, and now I'm, I'm a full-time musician. Like I'm, you know, I'm at home writing albums and recording and going on tour and, uh, and stuff like that. And it's really, it's really fun. And I feel very, very lucky to be able to do it. So I feel like I had two kind of dream careers. Like I was lucky enough, you know, hard work and luck, but a lot of luck to get a faculty job in physics, which is in itself a very difficult thing to be able to do. And then to walk away from that and do this other thing, which is a very difficult thing to be able to do as a job is kind of, you know, I have no idea what I ever did to be so lucky, but it, it just kind of worked out. Awesome. That is so awesome. Um, okay, so uh, we, we've got a few minutes left and I promise to open the floor to questions from the class. If anybody wants to ask one, um, why don't you unmute yourself? And uh, I guess if you have the question for a specific person, say Brooke or Brian, or you can just ask them both, but go for it. Oh, um, me? Or Ross, I fully expected you to go first. Okay. Um, uh, well, I guess I was just um, going to ask. I am uh, my my dream come true would be to have a faculty job in physics, and like, and this is for either Brian or Brooke. But like, what would you recommend as like the the best path to pursue that? Uh, one piece of advice that I got, which I think is important to say out loud. That's a great goal to have, but. One thing I was told when I went to grad school was you like you have to be okay emotionally with getting the PhD and then walking away. So I'd say the the most important thing to take the next step of going to grad school is just that you want to learn about physics. So the first like the uh, if you want to become a professor like you got to go to grad school. To, you know in physics at this point you can't become a faculty member without a PhD. So you have to find a grad school to, to go to. That, that's a good fit for you. Um, but I would also approach it with the mindset of like, every take is an end in itself. And if like, if you get a PhD, that's hard, but that's a really big, like cool thing to have. And if you could walk away with a PhD, that's great. If you get a postdoc after that, that's like even harder get that postdoc, that's like a super cool thing to be able to do. Be okay with walking away. And I'm not saying don't have goals. I'm not saying don't go for it. Don't have a goal. I certainly have the goal of being a faculty, uh, faculty member somewhere. But just realize that every step you take along that path, which is at this point, grad school, postdoc, like multiple postdocs, probably faculty position. At any point that might liter that might just be the cut off. I mean, a lot of people don't make it to the end of grad school even. Um, so that's just one, that, that was always my mindset, like be grateful for everything you get to, to, to be able to do. I would say 
I don't think it pays to be too, there's some people who'd be like, all right, look, you've got to go to this place and then you've got to go to this place and then you've got to go to that place. Fuck that. Like, come on. Everyone has, you know, different careers. There's obviously super top of the line places that put you in advantage. If you're a grad student or a postdoc at the fancy places, Harvard, Princeton, whatever, that probably gives you a leg up over, you know, over many other people, but like you got to do what fit for you. So I would say the best thing for you to do right now is uh, look at grad. I don't know what year you are in, in college, but like look at potential grad schools. Visit for us like is a freshman. Yeah. You're a freshman. Okay, so you have a lot of time. Like, don't even like. But it doesn't hurt to like think about this for the future. Like, do as many interesting things as as you can. Do stuff that's interesting to you, and then kind of. Once you get to be a junior or so, cast around for grad schools, visit, you have a lot of time to visit places and talk to people. Alex can recommend like who to talk to at various places. Uh, but, you know, the, your basic, the structure of your path is going to be undergraduate, graduate, postdoc, faculty, if you get to all those steps. And I honestly think the best thing you can do is just do what interests you the most and work hard at it. And beyond that, like, you know, I don't know how else to, I, I personally don't think it's worth being political and strategizing and that sort of thing. Well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, uh, actually, I'm a, actually, I'm a sophomore. Well, it's kind of weird. I skipped my freshman year, so I'm kind of a sophomore. So, Oh, come on, Ross. It's your first year at Mines. I got to call you a freshman. I know that technically you're a sophomore based on your years, but it's yeah. your first year at Mines. But the, the reason I was saying that is that uh, I obviously am under, I, I put myself under a lot of pressure and I think you have, what you said really helped me with that. So I wanted to say, and thank you so much for that. That really helped. Yeah, happy to help. Rookie, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I mean, I think I was, I would have, uh, without all the gloom and despair and reality that Brian uh, mentioned, I would have just said like, like focus on problems that excite you, um, whether that's a particular realm of research or particular classes, I just find the problems you're excited about and focus on them and then you'll work harder and you'll have better results and hopefully people will care. And so it's just kind of a follow up to Brian. It's like, just work on what you want to work on and focus on it. And uh, you'll have plenty of time for strategizing later if you decide that's what you need to do. Um, I would say, and I mean this, depending on where everyone's at, definitely do research as an undergrad if you can. Um, and, you know, uh, even like with me doing the, uh, I did this experimental stuff, even though that's no direction in which I went, it was just, A, it helped me get into grad schools, but it also really gave me a view of what different people were doing. I think you get so bogged down, like once you're, once you have an advisor in grad school and they're on, your physics gets really narrowed in a lot of way. You really start focusing on your work. So it's kind of a fun time where you can kind of see outside of the one little thing you're working on now. So try a lot of things, do some undergraduate research. Austin, you have a question? I, I do. And so for uh, Brooke and Brian, I got to confess that I'm actually not in this class. Uh, I am a physics student, but a friend shared me the link because he knows I'm an NSP fan. So um, first, I do have a question, a valid one, but I would just like to say hi, Ninja Brian. I saw you, I think, 2016 in Atlanta with Twerp and Starbomb at some point. It was a oh, lot awesome. of fun. At the but, Tabernacle. Yeah, tab, Tabernacle. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, Thanks. So yeah, I just wanted to say hello and meet you. I was legitimately even nervous to meet you, but here we are. Um, <laughs> my question, which is physics related. Uh, so I'm a senior. Um, I'm taking kind of like a gap. I'm going into the Peace Corps actually. It's all being delayed, of course, it's confusing, but I plan on applying to PhD programs and I find myself like slightly divided in my interests. Um, so as an undergraduate who has research experience in one field, in my case, it's solar physics. Uh, this is for Brooke or Brian, by the way. Um, if I have other interests, um, grad schools where you really, you, they really want you to specialize, you apply to groups, you apply to certain 
uh, potential advisors. Um, how likely is it and how good of idea, idea might it be to try and jump into a slightly different field of research that you're interested in? I think it's a great idea. I, I think mean, it's a great like, idea. Yeah. Like you, you, uh, you know, I, I, I did exactly this where I started in one area and then jumped to something else. Like actually a very different thing two years in. I think it's, I think like many people, you know, who are interested in physics, you can kind of, there, there's no right answer for what you want to do. Like you can kind of see yourself doing a lot of different stuff. At least many people can. So I think it's a great idea to, you know, move, not even like lateral move, but do something totally different and try it out. Uh, and it's honestly, it is what you're saying is right. It's hard to apply to, it's hard to get into a research group without any experience in that group. But the way to do it is apply to a group that you do have experience in. And while you're there, look around, you know, talk to other people in other groups, see if, you know, anything else sounds interesting. Maybe, you know, I know some places will have lots lab rotations uh, or, you know, or, or the theoretical equivalent thereof. Like, you know, it's, I, I think it's a great idea. I, I, I mean, I, I'm making up numbers, but I, I, I feel like probably 50%. Well, I, I would say of my incoming graduate class, maybe 50% knew what they wanted to do and 50% was still figuring it out. And then, 50% yeah. of the group that knew what they wanted to do ended up doing something else. Yep. Um, so even, I just think it probably depends a little bit on your specific fields and where you go to school, but even though it might feel right now like you're gonna apply to a program, get into that program and that's what you're gonna do, it's probably not the case. I mean, it could be the case, but it, it doesn't have to be the case. Just out of curiosity, what's, do you have a, something else in mind beyond the solar physics? So um, the, the current field of research I'm in is solar physics, uh, coronal magnetometry. And the other thing is um, I'm in a graduate quantum course and I'm really enjoying it. And we're doing quantum information theory and um, you know, what does it mean to violate Bell's inequality and all this stuff. And it's just really cool. Uh, I don't, there's nothing more specific than that, but I just really like, and we read a paper from a really recent paper, September, last September, on uh, local observer independence and like kind of a relational quantum mechanics point of view. Um, and all this stuff is just really exciting and seems to be happening right now. And I think I'd be very interested yeah. in doing it, even though I don't have quantum specific research experience or anything. Quantum, quantum information is actually a really great field because you can, there are some people who are kind of both experimenters and theorists. Uh, it's one of the very few things in physics with maybe the other exception being like tabletop condensed matter or atomic physics or something like that. Uh, but quantum information is awesome because the amount of fact you need to get into it is relatively mild compared to, you know, particle physics or something like that. And you can start doing interesting stuff right away. And as you said, it's really having a moment right now. Like it was like not doing so well you know, let's say but when I was in grad school, it like the kind of sinking and there wasn't much funding for it. And now it's like raging back. So that's a super cool thing to be interested in right now. Awesome, thanks. Thank you so yeah. much. Thanks, Austin. Madison. Hey, so I'm doing research with Alex right now. And I know all three of you kind of ended up not exactly where you expected to be when you first started physics. Do you ever like wish you had started somewhere else or wish you had done something else? Because like, I really love physics. I think it's very cool. I would love to continue it for the entire future of my life. But like, I don't know exactly how hireable it is, how good the academic environment is like you've all ended up in different places. Do you wish you had done anything differently or are you happy with the way you decided to pursue physics and then just ended up somewhere else? Um, I, I have two answers to that. One is uh, just, I don't know, I feel like I'm like, this is weirdly like, I don't know, life cult coachy or something, but it's just like, 
I, I have a lot of trouble, like my life, um, if I'm happy where I'm at, it's really hard to regret anything in the past because like you feel like, oh, like I made some stupid decision and X happened. But if, I, if that hadn't happened, there'd be a change and who knows where I'd be right now, right? So I, it's, I just like philosophically would don't regret any of the decisions I made, even the, the terrible ones, because um, I, I think it's helped define me. Um, but that said, if you're, if you, I think there's a lot of things you could do. Like you could go decide you were going to be an underwater basket weaver and then three, 30 years later be like, oh, you know, I, I need to feed myself and this isn't working and not feel like you have anywhere to go. But for good and bad reasons, you never have that problem with physics. It's this safe thing to, uh, you can like just dreamily pursue physics because if it ever doesn't work out, A, you've built up all these skills that are really useful and that's the good part. And B, um, people romanticize physicists. So if you ever apply for jobs outside of physics, people are like, oh, wow, you're a physicist, you must be so smart. And so it's really the safest thing you can do to pursue your dreams. Deciding to go become like a, a YouTube ninja is like a dangerous dream to pursue, where is like uh, deciding you wanna be a physicist, you, if it ever doesn't work out, you're probably going to be in a really great place to do almost anything else you want to do. Um, so those are my answers. Yeah, and I would say, like in my case, I would not change a single thing, but literally nothing. Uh, everything I did, you know, was a path on the thing to a path, a thing on the path to where I got today. So I, I think, to me, my whole like. I don't want to get like, like I don't want to get too philosophical here, but uh, the two principles that have served well are do what seems interesting. And if it's a calculated, but not insane risk tip. And if you follow I, like me following those principles, it's, uh, it's worked out, but you know, I've also been lucky. Like I was able to meet basic needs doing physics. Like I could, you know, as a grad student earn enough to eat, and things like that. So obviously there's like, you have to take care of your basic human needs first. If you can do that, then I don't think you can kind of go wrong just following whatever seems interesting to you at the time. Uh, any other questions? I'm sorry, Alex, you were also subject to this question, answer it. Oh, I can tell you my, my life story another time. We should take advantage of the the BW and BW that we have on with us tonight. Also tangentially, am I allowed to take bribes for the album for the rock opera? Because I have it. No one else does. Don't worry, I'm going to share a song with everyone. Oh, which one? Uh, well, um, we, we, can, we can segue into that right now. Um, oh, no. I you know, I haven't heard this since we did it. You realize that, right? Say it again. I, I have not listened to this since we made this. No, 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 10, no, 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 no. So, um, so, okay, so. Alex, there was someone, Sarah Jones, trying to raise their hand before you. Sarah, do you have a question? Well, I don't want to distract from everyone if you were about to show us this rock opera, because it's basically been folklore in the physics department for the past few years. Um, There's nothing to show you except you guys asked me to give you a tour of my place. So I made a video, <laughs> a video of this place as I bought it, and then what I turned it into, and the soundtrack to it is a song from the opera. It's two minutes long. You want to see it now? I do. Yeah, me too. I've never seen your place. You were there with me like a week ago. At Alex's place? Weren't you? No. No, no. he oh. wasn't. That was Fred. I confused you with Fred. That's yeah. Here we go.
That was really good. awkward because it's in silence. Um, okay, uh, we are we are well past schedule as usual. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm gonna let uh, folks go. If you want to go, you know, go ahead and take off. If you have a follow up question that you'd like uh, to ask Brookie and Brian, you can. Uh, Ask them as long as they're willing to stay on, but I, they're going to have to go too. They've got kids and wives and animals. Um, but thanks, thanks everybody for coming. I hope I get smiley faces back on the quiz, but I understand if all of you decided to work the first problem, it's probably pretty easy. So, oh, yes, nice, nice, nice. Uh, okay, thanks everybody. Um, and if you have a question for Brooke or Brian, uh, feel free to ask it. Um, otherwise, we'll shut this down. I have a question. Go ahead. Can I sneak in? Okay, so I'm also not actually in this class. Uh, <laughs> thanks for letting me sneak into um, the lecture. Um, I have a question. It's academic, but it's not physics, because uh, Dr. Ninja Brian, you said that you've studied philosophy, and I'm also at Mines in an ethics class right now. Um, which which of the uh, moral philosophies is your favorite? <laughs> Actually, I never did uh, moral philosophy, so I did like half of the philosophy major at at Williams, and I only did the analytic stuff. So I did philosophy of math and science and avoided all of the moral philosopher stuff. So I have no idea what's going on with that. Okay, um, fair enough. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other Question. questions? Um, so for Brooke and Brian, do you have any funny or embarrassing stories about Alex? <gasps> oh, 
Oh, they, I should have thought this was coming. Oh, there's a lot. You've got a gazillion <laughs> funny stories about me. Oh man, I I feel I I need a, a second. Go ahead to and tell them about uh, uh, your girlfriend uh, from CU. Oh, <laughs> you got to make it quick though. Uh, it's uh, it's not that funny of a story, except for I, I had been seeing this girl for you know several years, and we broke up around the time uh, we we left Colorado, and and I moved to Santa Barbara, and she moved to Los Angeles, uh, and we would talk on the phone from time to time, and Alex came out to visit. And we went down to Los Angeles to see a show or something and ended up like hanging out with him for one evening and, uh, and left. And then, you know, I just noticed a few months went by and every time I reached out to this uh, now ex-girlfriend and she never really responded and like, it just started getting weird. I didn't understand, like it was clear she was ghosting me and I didn't understand why. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, so finally one day I, I called her up and she answered and I was like, hey, you know, what's been going on? Like, why haven't you been talking to me? And she was like, look, you know, it's totally cool. You're gay and everything, but it was just really messed up for you to bring your boyfriend here and introduce him to all my friends and not give me a heads up beforehand. And so I started to defend myself and say, but I'm not gay, what are you talking about? And then I was like, wait a minute, if I was coming out of the closet and this is the way I chose to do it, you better just deal with it. Do you know how hard that would be? And I started defending it from that point perspective and uh, uh, that, that didn't uh, help convince her I, I, Alex was not my boyfriend. Uh, it, it's not the only time he's been mistaken by my boyfriend. <laughs> actually we spend way too much time together or used to that's true can't top that like so yeah um yeah so i, I i'm going to tell one quick story that some of you have heard but you hear you need to know about it because it's the it's the fate of the principal piece of the wwf paper which is that we and I think it was in that paper that we invented the word monographal. Mm -hmm. And we, yep. part of our ambition was to try and get the word monographal into, you know, science literacy and people use it pretty regularly. So anyway, when, when I was a postdoc and Brookie was a grad student, we ended up at a summer institute in Carges, uh, which is off the, or it's part of the island of Corsica. But anyway, um, and at the beginning of this two week summer school, we were told there was gonna be a gong show at the end. And uh, so we of course thought that the gong show was, you know, a, a traditional TV gong show where you perform and they have a big gong behind the judges and they get up and they bang the gong if you suck and otherwise they give you a, a score. But anyway, so, um, so we heard there was going to be a gong show at the end of the summer school or at the end, at the end of the summer school. So we decided to write a song about monodrafold and we uh, got uh, our uh, Australian friend to do interpretive dancing and we got a Polish, Piotr. Polish, yeah, Polish guy to come and do uh, harmonica. And so the last day they start the gong show and we were surprised to discover that a physics gong show is actually a series of five minute talks. They were presentations. <laughs> And we were going last and we didn't really have the mechanism to put together slides and shit. And so we were just kind of nervous. And then they start banging through these presentations after presentations after presentation. And it got really fucking boring. So in the end, we were actually pretty damn excited that we got to get up and perform our Monodrafold song and I think we were uh, actually the hit uh, of the gong show. So, uh, and I think it was the birth of a tradition in various other physics contexts where you guys wrote songs about music. Am I mistaken? 
the uh, uh, 2005 Strings Annual Conference in Toronto. That Brooke was great. and I and a couple other people busked outside the the main lecture hall where we wrote a song that involved the top the titles of every talk at the uh at the conference i actually i literally just pulled mp3 i have it on my computer right now uh, i would that uh, yeah. I, yeah i'll send it to you i would like to hear that alex and i um i went to visit alex to work on a paper when he was in australia and and i I, I had a very unsuccessful career as a musician, and I'm using the word musician as loosely as possible. Um, but I played a show in, in Australia, and Alex, um, Alex uh, and I wrote a song for that. No, we didn't write a song. We covered uh, an Air Supply song. <laughs> um, so there's been a lot of music um, uh, in our... I know just how to whisper And I know just how to cry I know just where to find the answers And I know just how to lie and physics do. <laughs> heard that before. You never said that to me. Yeah. We actually performed it at a nightclub in, uh, in Australia. Uh, okay, everybody. Oh, Madison's got a question. I have one more question. Sorry. Yeah. Um, as prolific musicians, as all three of you are, um, how did you keep doing music when you were in grad school and stuff? Like, I play bass, I enjoy doing music. I never do it anymore because physics is difficult. How did you keep doing it? I mean, I just like made time for it. I actually, I, when I was in grad school, I bought a, like an upright piano, like a real piano, not an electric one. And I just had that 
in my apartment I shared and I would take time to play it. I just, I set side, uh, time aside to, to be in bands and had one in San Diego. It was like a jam band thing that would gig a couple times a month. Honestly, it's, you know, I, I tried to never let it conflict with physics, but that wasn't always successful. Uh, I just kind of made it a priority uh, at certain times. Yeah. So it was really just structuring and, and setting aside time to do it. Brian was a musician and actually had to spend time, but we just sat around drinking, playing music together. And uh, I don't know. Uh, and then at some point, um, kind of into grad school, post-Dockish, um, I started writing songs and playing little shows. Um, and the nice thing about that was um, I was able to play shows like all over Europe. Um, on the diamond, I just like, I would, wherever I went to give a talk, I would like, this would date me a little bit, but I'd find places on MySpace and I'd send them my music and then like book these little shows. So I ended up playing shows all over Europe, which I never could have done on my own dime, but I'd go give a lecture at some university and then, uh, then go play a show at some like grubby club with 15 people in it. Um, and so it was fun, but for me, it was always a, uh, uh, yeah, it didn't take the same kind of time it takes to actually have talent and do good stuff. Okay, everyone, we are way past uh, time, um, but I want to, again, thank you all for coming. Uh, this was actually really, really enjoyable to me, um, and I really do appreciate you all uh, hanging out and thanks again to Brookie and Brian for uh, their wonderful insights um, and their funny stories. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to sign us off there so that we can all go and have an evening. Um, but thanks again, everybody for coming. Thanks guys. This was awesome. Thanks everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks all of y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Even though I'm not a fan, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.